for those of you who are parents, let me ask you a question. How many of you have, ever, you have wonderful memories of special times with your children? Okay, hands down. How many of you can also remember some discouraging times when you really wondered if you, they were going to make it and be okay? You know, both of those are realities. I can remember that there have been, there have been times with my kids that I'm just so gratified and so grateful to be their father. And then there were some other times when we were going through hard times that I was discouraged. And I wondered, are these kids going to turn out okay? And, you know, most of the time they do. You know, not every parent has that, that privilege, but most of the time kids do turn out. I came across some statistics this week from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And there was a little calculator, a graph, that was used to determine how much it costs to raise a child to the age of 22 if they go straight out of high school into college. So according to the U.S. government website, the average cost of raising a child in the Midwest from birth to age 22 through college is about $350,000. Actually, that $350,000 was supposed to be a blank in your bulletins. So if you, if you want to keep track in your bulletins, the $350,000 is not in there. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money, a big investment. Now, I think they take into account you're providing them with a home for 22 years, you know, maybe the first 20 while they're in maybe community college and then you helping with some tuition. But that's, that's a lot of money. But you know what? When they turn out and when you have that love, it's absolutely all worth it, isn't it? There really isn't any dollar value you can put on the joy that your children bring you. There really isn't. And I could reverse it. And for those of us who are children who have wonderful parents, there is no way to put a dollar value on what they have given you. Truly, there is no possible way to, to just fully appreciate that. Bringing up children can be a challenge though, can't it? So, Bob, were you the only one that got breakfast in bed this morning? Yeah. Well, th this, is a this is a story from about 15 years ago about uh, some children that got together and decided to fix breakfast for their dad in bread on bed on Father's Day. And they brought him coffee in bed. And he said, I took one sip of the coffee and it was the worst stuff I had tasted in my life. And he said, I was trying to figure out how they could have messed it up so bad. And he said, I got to the bottom of the cup. And in the bottom of the cup, there were three other little army guys. <laughs> and the dad said, boys, what are these army guys doing in the bottom of, of the cup? And the little boy said, hey, this is going back about 20 years. Well, you know, Dad, like that coffee commercial on TV, the best part of waking up is soldiers in your cup. <laughs> I mean, can't you see a kid doing that? I mean, that's, they didn't hear soldiers, they heard soldiers. So, kids are precious. They, they really are. They bring us so much joy. Uh, just a couple of other funny stories with kids about... Parents decided to take their, their son to the ballet, wanted to give him some class and some culture. And they were about halfway through the performance when the, when the eight-year-old turned to his dad and said, Dad, why didn't they just get taller dancers instead of having them stand on their toes the whole time? Absolutely makes perfect sense for a kid, doesn't it? And then as the kids get older, they start to figure more things out, don't they? One more story before we get into the, into the message itself about some, uh, a father and mother that took their 11-year-old in for, an, uh, for his physical. And he was at 11, he was starting to be a little more independent and starting to express, express things a little better. And so he said, I would like to answer the doctor's questions this time. And so his mom said, okay, that's fine. So she, the nurse said to him, how are you sleeping? And he replied, I sleep very well. How's your appetite? And he said, I eat anything in sight. Good, said the nurse, and how are your bowels? 
And he said, I know them all. A, E, I, O, and U. <laughs> Even when they begin to figure things out, they still need us. Because they don't have it all figured out. And part of the challenge is to allow them to be young people, which means they don't know what we have learned over the course of 30 or 40 or 50 or more years. Being there for them, being a stable place, a family that loves them even though we are not perfect. This morning we're going to do something a bit different. I want to look at the book of Proverbs and we're going to be talking about important parts of being a good parent. And let me tell you, this morning's message could actually be a bit controversial for some. When's the last time you heard me say that? I want to challenge you with some things that Scripture says because of what I see going on in our culture. It, straight from Scripture, and I think you will, I hope that you'll be able to understand what I'm saying and the need for a message like the one that I'll be sharing with you this morning. So, let's... Let's start with this. The theme for this morning is basically practical instructions for dads from the book of Proverbs. And if you're keeping notes, here, here is the first point. Let's begin with this. We must impact our children. I don't know of any dad or mom, for that matter, who doesn't want to make a difference in their children's lives. We welcome them into the world, and from the moment that they are born... We have a connection with them. Those of you who are parents, how many of you remember the birth of your firstborn? Absolutely. I mean, you can't forget that, can you? I mean, it's one of those defining moments in life. In fact, I remember the birth of each of my children. I remember holding them. I remember the precious moments, and I remember the diapers. Oh, my. I remember being spit up on. And my parents remember the same things. I have heard stories from my parents about how my dad used to get dressed for work. My parents got married. My dad was 19. My mom was 20. Actually, 18 and 19. I arrived about 10 months later. So they didn't have a lot of time to adjust. And my dad would pick me up every morning before he left for work. And I would spit up all over him every single day. And he would have to go change clothes. So... What they experienced is very similar to what I experience and what parents today experience. In many ways is very close to what you and your parents and their parents and their parents and their parents experience. There's some of parenting that just doesn't change. We'll be talking a little bit later about there are some parts of parenting that is changing and about some things that we need to do. This morning, let's begin by looking at Proverbs 1, verse 8. And actually, it'll be on the screen. Read it along with me, if you would. Here is what Solomon wrote. My child, listen when your father corrects you. Don't neglect your mother's instructions. While the pr primary command is given to children, there are implications for parents as well. If they are to listen to us, then we need to be giving them wise counsel. So if my children need to value and treasure my correction and my instruction, then I need to make sure that I am teaching them the right things. So I need to be teaching them things that are wise, things that will help them, things that will help them become who they are to be. We need to be sure that we teach them the truth, that we give them a foundation on which to build their lives. The implication of the passage would include the example that we set as well. You know, if you're going to tell your children they can't, they have to control their temper, guess what? You better control your own. If you're going to tell them don't lie, they can't see you lying. Because if they have to choose between what you say and what you do, I can tell you, they will choose what you do. Now, none of us are perfect. But if we're going to be the proper example, if we are going to make an impact, if we're going to tell them, listen to what I'm telling you, then we also have to show them that we are trying to live the same way. Now, the reality is sometimes we will mess up. I wish I could tell you that I've never lost my temper with my children. But then that would be a lie, and then I would have to apologize for lying, so I'm not going to do that. I, I don't do that often, but there have been times, 
And even sometimes I would say it was appropriate. Sometimes they needed to be corrected and it needed to be done very sternly. But if I'm going to teach them, then I also have to show them. I can't merely tell them. And that's the reality. He says, listen, when your father corrects you, don't neglect, the teach, don't neglect your mother's instruction. And so what he's saying here relates to both fathers and mothers. Here's the point, and this is the next statement in your notes. Parents are to teach their children the lessons they need for life. They need you to teach them. They're not going to get that everywhere. They are frequently not going to see your values represented when they're watching television. I'm not telling you to get rid of your TV. That's not what I'm saying at all. But you need to be intentionally passing along your values because they're going to learn their values from somewhere. And frankly, it needs to be from you. They are to listen, they're to watch, they're to follow, and we are to intentionally teach. We are to pass along not just our values, but God's values. I want to look at another passage that kind of makes a similar point. Proverbs 6, verses 20 to 22. It takes what we've been saying even further. Here is what Solomon writes in chapter 6. He says, My son, obey your father's commands and, new, and don't neglect your mother's instruction. Very, very similar to what the first passage said. Then he says, keep their words always in your heart, tie them around your neck. When you walk, their counsel will lead you. When you sleep, they will protect you. When, they, when you awake, they will advise you. I want, my primary interest to start out with is in verse 20. And he says, my son, obey your father's commands. The Hebrew word for obey is the word natsar. Aren't you so blessed by knowing that? I'm teasing, but do you know what it means? It doesn't mean to obey in the sense that we think of obeying. It means to guard it because it's valuable. Jeff, do you lose things sometimes? Sometimes. Why do you think Jeff kept up with the bill, that $100 bill that's for Julie? I heard it. What? It's important. It's valuable. It's worth a lot. His point here is, when he says, my son, obey, my son, treasure. My son, guard this because this is really, really important. You need to be hearing this. And when we pass along those wise things to our children, we want to teach them, this is important. This is for you. Now, let me ask a question. Are they going to always hear you? No, they are not. In fact, frankly, children go through stages where sometimes, I don't know how to say this, but I'm just going to spit it out. Sometimes they're going to think you're the dumbest person God ever made. And if you remember, you went through that stage too, most likely. It's a stage. It will pass. But what we pass along to them needs to be important and significant. Parents, it's our responsibilities to teach them the things that they need for life. And kids, it's your responsibility to listen and learn those things. When we are teaching them the right things, we are equipping them, we're guarding them as well. We're protecting them. Now, what they do with it, there is a part of that that is their responsibility. But we are responsible to teach them and make that a point. So... Here, here is the next statement in your notes. The Hebrew word translated obey comes from a word suggesting our children should guard what we teach them because it is so valuable. A number of years ago I read a book by a Jewish man. Michael Medved was his name. He was actually a conservative gentleman who... Um, very, very interesting guy. And here is what he said. He said, by the time children turn six... Now think of this now. By the time the average child turns six, they have spent more time watching television than they will end up speaking with their parents in their entire lifetime. That's by age six. That's not too hard when you imagine that what they did was actually to determine that they actually attached a microphone to toddlers to see how much time each week the average parent actually conversed with the child. I'm not meaning where you said, come to dinner, 
uh, pick up your toys. No, where there was actual conversation going on between the parent and the child. And by doing that, they determined the average amount of time that parents spend with their children each week. Anybody want to guess how much time the average mom talked directly to her child in a week? Six hours less. Did I hear three hours? Less. One hour. Less. The average mom spent 50 minutes a week in conversation with her children. 50 minutes. But boy, did they do well compared to dads. Guess how much the average dad spent in conversation with their children? Less. Less. 15 minutes. Now, I want to be very clear. I'm not talking about every dad, and I'm not talking about every mom. This was when they hooked these microphones up and they monitored the children and the parents. It was averaging out 15 minutes a week for the dads and 50 minutes a week for the mom. Let me just be really blunt. If you park them in front of the television for 40 hours a week and you talk to them for 15 minutes or 50 minutes, they're going to develop values that do not represent yours. It's just that simple. It is just that true. And I'm not saying that all of us as parents at times had things that were going and we didn't need the kids to watch television so we could get stuff done. But I'm telling you, if you are not intentional in sharing your values with your children, they will not adopt your values. It's just that simple. It is just that simple. Now... Let's move a little further into the passage, or into the message this morning. I want to look at the second point, and this is the second. And here we'll get a little more controversial. Second point. Not only must we, we started with we must impact our children, not, but we must also correct our children. We must take the time to be involved in disciplining them. And this isn't a very popular theme these days, but it's one of the things that the book of Proverbs speaks about very forcefully and Frequently. I'm going to put the passage on the screen and then let's talk about it. Here is what it says in Proverbs 13, 24. He says, those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. Now the statement Solomon makes here is quite dramatic. He says, listen, you need to discipline your children. Starting at the end of the verse, he makes the point that if you don't discipline your children, in fact, you don't love them. In fact, at the beginning of the verse, he says, if you don't discipline them, you actually hate them. Now, did he mean that these parents actually had horrible attitudes toward their children? That's not what he was saying. He was saying that if you love your children, you need to be involved in providing discipline. Now, let me be really clear. The only kind of discipline, I'm not talking about spanking, is the only kind of discipline. That's not at all what I'm saying. But you have to be involved in your children's lives and you have to teach them right and wrong. There is a concept going around today that they, people say, I will allow my five and six and seven year old to determine right and wrong. Folks, they're not equipped at five, six and seven to determine right and wrong. They're not going to come through moral issues and think about spiritual implications. They're not going to do that. It's not going to happen. They're not equipped at five, six, and seven years old to make moral decisions. They don't have the background yet. That's your job. My job. Children have to be taught discipline. They have to. It's our job. Kelly has some friends that she, a friend that she works with, and she's a delightful lady. A, a very delightful lady, but she has two children and she, she doesn't believe in disciplining them. She never disciplines them. I'm not bad-mouthing this lady, but she's got a disaster on her hands. Her sophomore daughter decides when she'll go to school and when she won't. I remember Kelly talking about how a few years ago the mom would, her kids would cuss and she would laugh at them. And it's like, you know, 
don't you see there's a connection here? I mean, you have to teach them. You have to provide some discipline. Because if you don't, there's no boundaries. And, and there... Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Have you ever been around a child that had no discipline whatsoever? Raise your hand. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to identify the child. But have you ever been around one of those kids? Okay, and they're always pushing and they're always trying. Have you ever noticed those children... And have you ever asked the question, are they happy? And they're not. They're actually searching for boundaries. They're looking for, they're looking for somebody who will be stable. And, and they're not finding it. Well, I'm gonna, I've got a sh story to share with you in a few minutes that just makes that point in real dramatic, dramatic fashion. So, next statement in your notes. Part of parents loving their children is providing appropriate discipline. Now, the discipline must be appropriate. There's purpose in the way discipline is done. I want you to understand something. Discipline is not for your benefit. It's for their benefit. Over the last 50 years, society has increasingly bought into the concept of making sure that children feel valued, but never questioning the child. Never saying, you're wrong. You know what they've discovered over the last 50 or 60 years? Children now have incredible self-esteem. Because everybody tells them they're wonderful. And everybody gets a prize. Even if you come at the very last minute and you do no effort whatsoever, you will get a prize in today's culture. Not only is it stupid, now, I know, you're left wondering what I think. Okay. Not only is it stupid, it's not fair to the child. Because in the real world, if you put in no effort, you'll get fired. Right? You put no effort in at college, you'll flunk out. So perhaps it's no surprise that kids are flunking out of college at incredibly record rates today because they've been told you are a success just for being here. That's not true. You are loved by God, period. You don't have to do anything to be loved by God. But if you put no effort in into life, you'll get very little out of life. That's what this is all about. It's about learning that we need to provide our children with appropriate discipline. We need to teach them the truth. I came across research this week that illustrates in vivid color exactly what I'm talking about. Anybody read the research that Pew, Pew just came out with? It was reported on about a month ago. For the first time in 130 years, guess what the primary living arrangement or living situation of kids between 18 and 34? Guess where more of them live? The highest percentage of kids in this category ever. And I say kids, I know 18 to 34 is not a kid. Young adults. Anybody want to guess the predominant thing? Bingo. For the first time in 130 years, more, children, more young people in the 18 to 34 categories are living with mom and dad than ever before. More kids, and I say kids, I'm meaning young adults, in the 18 to 34 group are living with mom and dad than even living with spouses or girlfriends or boyfriends. And the numbers continue to rise. Now, does all of that go back to what I'm talking about discipline? No, not all of it. Some of it's economic. Young adults go to college and they can't find work. And I understand that there is certainly an economic component. But I have to tell you folks, that's not at all. That's not all of it. If children don't learn to be responsible, then they don't accept responsibility. You know what I'm talking about? To some extent, I'm preaching to the choir. But we adults, we Christian adults, aren't doing a real great job with this either. We have to discipline and instill responsibility and values in our kids because we're the ones responsible to do it. We can do a little bit of it here at church, but let's be honest. We have your children here to teach them about an hour a week. That's not enough. You guys have to be the ones doing it. And I'm not just talking to you. I've got kids that I've got a 14-year-old at home too. That, but they have to learn these things. Unless you think, in case you think I'm not, I'm being too dramatic, I want to show you another passage. 
This one actually goes even further. Proverbs 23, verses 13 and 14. Here's what it says. Don't fail to discipline your children. They won't die if you spank them. Physical discipline may well save them from death. Now, you have to discipline your children. There's actually a play on words here. We have to be careful that we don't make Scripture say more than it says or less than it says. Look closely. The point is that when a, chi- when a parent gives an appropriate spanking, you are in fact helping the child, not hurting them. Is there some pain involved? I was spanked as a kid. I know the answer to that one. Not only did I survive, I, I don't mean this bad, but I developed into a healthy, productive adult because I learned responsibility. I knew. There is no question in my mind to this day. If I had told my mom to shut up, whoa, ho, 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 ho. I would have only done it once. It wouldn't have happened again. It wouldn't have happened again. Not because my parents didn't love me, but in fact because they did. Now, am I saying that everything a child does that's a mistake, every, every time they misbehave you ought to spank them? Absolutely not. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm saying that there are moments that I think that that is appropriate. And it's not, I'm not telling you that because of what I think. I'm telling you that because of what Scripture says. There is some pain from a spanking, but his point here is that short-term pain may teach long-term lessons that are valuable for the child. And notice the larger point that the writer is making. The real point of discipline is to save the child from problems in the future. The whole point is children need to learn. And sometimes... An appropriate spanking is, is, in fact, appropriate. By disciplining a child now, you're protecting them from bigger problems later. The goal with discipline is keeping your eye on the big picture. It's about the child. It's not about you. It's not about you. Now, let, let me be really clear, because I want to provide some balance here. Spankings are never intended to be a vent for your own frustration. Okay? If you're mad and about to lose it, don't spank. That's the wrong time. Because it's not about you. If you're doing it for you, you're doing it for the wrong reason. But sometimes children, even the best of kids, can be a little rebellious. And I'm not talking teenagers. That's a whole different story. I don't think spankings for teenagers, that's not, that's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about for the little guys. I'm talking about, and I'm, and I'm not talking about abusive. And in fact, I'm going to define some differences in just a few minutes. Because I really want you to understand... But what I'm telling you is, we dare not buy into this nonsense that's going around today that says you let the children make all the decisions and never discipline them. Okay, I'm going to be a little crass. That's a load of crap. And if you don't believe it, look at what's happening in our society. I mean, it's just, it's, it's nonsense. It doesn't work. And the consequences are disastrous. Guys, we've got to be teaching our children and appropriate. Love the children in every way possible. But you're the parents. You're the grandparents. Be involved. Teach them. Train them. Correct them. Confront them. They need that. They want that. It's essential. I want to give you an adapted quote from Charles Swindoll. I think this is really good. He said, Appropriate discipline with our children is neither extreme or harsh. It strengthens both self-esteem and self-discipline. There's the goal. Dr. Charles Swindoll is a wonderful man. I respect him immensely. He's written numerous books. So on track. He, he laid out some concepts in a book called Growing Wise in Family Life. And let me, he, he distinguishes between abuse and correction. Listen to what he says. He writes, abuse is unfair and unexpected. The child is never sure what's going to set the parent off. Proper discipline is fair and expected for misbehavior. Abuse is degrading and demoralizing. Proper discipline upholds the child's dignity and points out that the child is so value, valuable that the inappropriate behavior cannot be allowed to continue. Abuse is extreme, harsh, and brutal. While proper, 
While proper discipline is balanced and operates within limits. Abuse leaves physical and emotional scars, but proper discipline not only doesn't leave scars, but it helps a child mature. Abuse results from frustration and anger while proper discipline operates out of love and concern for the child. Abuse creates terror and resentment, but appropriate discipline leads to healthy respect for authority. Finally, abuse destroys self-esteem while proper discipline strengthens self-esteem and self-discipline. Isn't that good? That's exactly what we're talking about. And the point here is that discipline, which I believe includes spankings. Let me, let me, let me say something real quickly. If you, if you just can't go there, you just can't see that. If you're not going to do that, I, and I think you should within the balance and the parameters that I've laid out. But if you're not going to do that, you still get involved in discipline with your children. They absolutely need it. You're helping them. And that's really the point I'm going to make in this last section. We need to, finally, for the third point, we need to protect our children. A child that isn't properly disciplined will be a foolish child through no fault of their own. The child who isn't given proper limits as they're growing up will not develop self-discipline. Look at what it says, what Proverbs 17.25 says. He says, Foolish children bring grief to their fathers and bitterness to the one who gave them birth. I think it's significant that he includes both fathers and mothers. Do you see that there? Bring grief to their father and bitterness to the one who gave them birth. Who gave them birth? Well, it wasn't the father. It's the father and the mother he's speaking of here. The child who isn't taught and disciplined will grow up to bring his parents grief. While it may be difficult to discipline children when they're small, I'm telling you, that's when you have to do it. Let me put it another way. You're not only doing your children a favor, you're doing yourself a favor too. You're going to help your children. We have to teach our children to respect us. Now I know I've parented five children. I have three biological children and two bonus children. And they all push the boundaries sometimes. I know probably your children never did that, but mine did. Okay? I understand the philosophy of Mark Twain when he said, you know, when a child turns 15, you ought to put him in a barrel and feed him through a knot hole. Yeah, this is Mark Twain's philosophy of parenting. When they turn 15, put him in a barrel and make sure there's a knot hole and you feed him through the knot hole. And he said when they turn 16, plug the knot hole. Now, he wasn't really advocating that. that was, he, was, he, was, he was making a, a funny point. The point is, sometimes being a parent's tough. And sometimes you have to know when to let something slide because you can't fight about everything. But I fear too many parents today, we let almost everything slide. We don't make a point of actually speaking up and saying, you know, that's wrong. I want you to know, I get on my kids' nerves because we'll be watching something on television and something ungodly will come on and I will say, that's just wrong. And they say, oh, Dad, don't say stuff like that. But I want them to know that's not my values. You can't get your kids out of the world. That's not possible. It's not reality. And I don't do that every single time. But they need to know where you stand. They need to know that there is right and wrong. In our relativistic world, where everything is relative to redefinition. They need to know that God has standards and so do you. That's essential that they understand that. Okay. Let me look at another, let's look at another passage and we're coming to the conclusion. Here's what he says in Proverbs 30 verse 17. He says, The eye that mocks a father and despises a mother's instruction will be plucked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by vultures. Talk about dramatic. He says, listen, the child that has no respect and hasn't been taught discipline, they're going to end up in deep, 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 deep trouble. He's not putting down the child. He's making a point that this is going to... The consequences are extreme when there is not any discipline. And so indirectly, he is saying to us as parents, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to discipline our children out of love. 
I want to conclude with a great story told by Christian psychologist Dr. James Dobson in his classic book, Dare to Discipline. Anybody here read the book? It's, it's a great book. I think this is from that book. It could have been from one of these others, but I believe. Dobson tells the story of a 10-year-old boy named Robert. Robert was out of control. It was, it was terrible. Robert's mom had no control over Robert whatsoever. And at 10 years old, when he would go to the, when he would go to the doc, his pediatrician's office, he was so out of control that he would tear up magazines and throw the papers all over the room. He would yell at his mom. He would yell at anybody who disturbed him in any way possible. And when the, when the staff at the doctor's office heard that Robert was coming for a visit, they would say, batten down the hatches, Robert is on the way. Because he, he was a holy terror. Well, on one particular visit to the pediatrician, the pediatrician noticed that Robert had cavities. And he thought to himself, which friendship, which dentist am I going to make an enemy out of when I refer this child? It was that bad. It was terrible. So he finally decided on a friend who was a dentist who had a reputation for being wonderful with children. So he sent this friend... He called a friend and said, Robert is a particularly difficult patient. He is very out of control. Would you be willing to see him? The dentist said, yeah, I'll, I'll see him. Robert went to the dentist office and he was, he was ready. He announced when he met the dentist, I am not getting in the chair. And the dentist said, well, son, to treat your teeth, to fix your cavities, you need to be in the chair. And he said, Robert said, you didn't understand. I said, I'm not getting in the chair. And the dentist said, well, son, for me to fix your teeth, you have to get in the chair. And Robert looked at the dentist and said, if you make me get in that chair, I'm going to take all my clothes off. <laughs> the dentist said, take them off, son. The little boy unbuttoned his shirt. He took his shoes off. He took his socks off. He looked at the dentist and said, I'm not getting in that chair. I'm going to take all my clothes off. The dentist said, take them off. Little boy unbuttoned his belt, he undid his, his button, and he zipped the zipper down, and now he is standing there in the dentist office with nothing but his fruit of the looms. And the dentist says, son, hop in the chair. And Robert's not quite sure what to make of this dentist, because he's never had anybody do this before. And he says, you don't understand. I said, I'm not going to get in that chair. I'll take all my clothes off. The dentist said, take them off, son exactly what he does. He drops his drawers and sitting there naked as the day he was born and the dentist said, now son, hop in the chair. Ten-year-old naked Robert hops in the dentist chair. He said it was amazing. He was really quiet. He was very cooperative. He filled his teeth. When the teeth were filled and he was done, he says to the dentist, now give me back my clothes. And the dentist says, you can come back tomorrow. Tell your mom I will have your clothes for you tomorrow. Can you imagine the waiting room? Ten-year-old Robert comes to the door, opens the door, walks out to his mother. The two of them walk down from the doctor's office out across the parking lot to the car and go home. The mother came the next day to pick up the clothes and she said, could I please speak with the doctor? And the dentist came out and she said, doctor, I don't know how to thank you. He has been pulling that trick on me for years and I never had the guts to call him on it. He has been a totally different boy the last 24 hours. Now, I've never seen a situation personally that is that extreme, but I'm telling you, you have to set boundaries with your children. You have to discipline them. <laughs> no, I'm not. I... It is essential for the children, because you love them, that they do not control your home. For their sake. Let's conclude. I've gone along this morning. But I hope you heard my passion. Our children are at stake. And we have to fight for them.
We have to be involved. And I understand many of you are grandparents, not parents, and you can't do the primary stuff. But we have to teach them. We have to instruct them. We have to value them. We have to talk to them. We have to make time for them. God, thank you for your love for us and for your love for our children and grandchildren. God, I pray that we would intentionally be involved. I pray that we would intentionally provide discipline. I pray that we intentionally would discipline. Always with love, with firmness, but with compassion. God, thank you for our children. Help us to teach them and train them to love you and to live disciplined lives that will serve them well throughout the remainder of their lives. In your name we pray.